Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observations Group MACV SOG was a highly classified multi-service United States Special Operations Unit which conducted covert unconventional warfare operations prior to and during the Vietnam War. Established on 24 January 1964, the unit conducted strategic reconnaissance missions in the Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, North Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, carried out the capture of enemy prisoners, rescued downed pilots. Conducted rescue operations to retrieve prisoners of war throughout Southeast Asia and conducted clandestine agent team activities and psychological operations. The unit participated in most of the significant campaigns of the Vietnam War, including the Gulf of Tonkin incident which precipitated increased American involvement, Operation Steel Tiger, Operation Tiger Hound, the Tet Offensive, Operation Commando Hunt, the Cambodian Campaign, Operation Lam Sun 719, and the Easter Offensive. The unit was downsized and renamed Strategic Technical Directorate Assistance Team 158 on 1 May 1972 to support the transfer of its work to the Strategic Technical Directorate of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, part of the Vietnamization effort. The Studies and Observations Group, also known as SOG, MAC SOG, and MAC V SOG, was a top secret, joint unconventional warfare task force created on 24 January 1964 by the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a subsidiary command of the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, MAC V. The unit would eventually consist primarily of personnel from the United States Army Special Forces, the United States Navy SEALs, the United States Air Force, USAF, the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, and elements of the United States Marine Corps Force Reconnaissance Units. One such warrior is Larry Trimble. Code name: Bambler. Interview. July 26, 2022. I was raised up in Decatur, Illinois. I was born there uh Went to, with my parents to uh, Dawson City, Oklahoma. It's right close to Tulsa. And of course, we moved back into Decatur then when I was probably about 10 years old. So I stayed there until I went into the service and finished school there. So you went to the service. So did you have any military influences growing up? Uh, the interest in military well people that were in the military that you talked to uh, you found out about their history ww2 guys of korea not really bruce uh, i was we used to play army all the time i always interested in uh, military because of that and uh, i just hoped that someday i'd be able to go into the military but i don't think that back at them days much the um, People talked about the World War II or, you know, Korea much and hell, I even tried to go to Korea and I was too damn young, <laughs> so, and they wouldn't have let me in, you know, because you had to have your permission from your parents, you know. But did you try? I tried. Okay. I just talked to a recruiter, you know, but that's as far as it went. Mm. He, I don't know what he did. He probably just kind of smiled at me and led me on. But, <laughs> at what age did you know that you wanted to be in the military? that I wanted to be in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, right as soon as I turned 17, I started looking uh, because I wanted to go into the military ever since I okay. was gone and, and uh, playing army with sticks, you know, and everything. But uh, I've always felt that that's what I wanted to do in my life. So uh, why did you pick the army over the other military? Well, that's uh, an easy question, too, because uh, Back in the older days, out in front of the post office, they used to have these pyramids and they'd have military uh, stuff on it. Well, they had a picture of one of these by ours of a paratrooper jumping out the door. And uh, that, that nailed it right there of what service I wanted to go into. And so I talked to the recruiter and uh, the recruiter said that I would have to have uh, permission from my parents, uh, still being 17, and so I tried to talk my mom into it, but I approached it the wrong way. I said I wanted to go into the paratroopers, and uh, she didn't buy that too well, of course, you know, so I said, well, just sign up for me to go in the service, and mom <laughs> says that'll work, and of course, whenever I got in, I went to St. Louis and then uh, Fort Leonard Wood uh, for in processing. And of course, they had at that time. Uh, they had um, they assigned me down to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for basic. 
and in basic what well, they were recruiting for paratroopers. Well, of course, the Army owed me then, so I was able to uh, go straight up to jump school right after basic training. So was that uh, Binning or Fort Bragg? Fort Bragg. Okay. They had a uh, one of the cadre guys that I'll always remember was, uh, they called him Bloody Burns. I don't know if you ever heard mm -hmm. of it, but he could run all over that post and never stop running. So uh, Bloody Burns and I went through. Actually, we did not finish jump school until after December. Uh, after basic uh, training, it was uh, towards the end or the first of November. and. Uh, they were just, in fact, we was in a new, brand new billet there, Fort Bragg, that they had built, which now is probably all the old buildings, you know. And uh, uh, we kind of milled around, went through training and stuff like that, but we actually did not start jump school because they wanted the, no breaks or nothing in it, you know, and prepared when we went through jump school then, uh, first of January, uh, I think what is it, eight weeks of jump school or six weeks of jump school, whatever it was, uh, to get our wings. I had told, uh, sent my mom a, a letter and told her I was going into airborne school, not jump school, but <laughs> airborne school. And uh, the first she knew was, of course, I invited her for uh, the, um, uh, when we got graduated for jump school, you know, and and that was the first, and she didn't have too much to say, but I'm sure she did to yeah. all her sisters and stuff, but I gave her my blood wings, you know, at that time. She accepted that, you know, and everything. But were at that time with the blood wings, were they actually pounded into your chest? No. No. No, I think that must have happened a year later, but uh, no. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Did. After jump so, school, what unit? did you go to? I, I went to the, uh, I was in B Company of uh, 505, 11th Airborne Division in Germany. Uh, right after I, I got out of jump school, they uh, signed to, uh, quite a few of us to packets, and uh, we took the USS Darby, a boat, over to Burma Harbor, and then a train up to Augsburg, and I was signed to the uh, 505th. Uh, I was in a company of 505th, as I remember. So you went from there to the 187th? I went from there to the 187th, whenever they deactivated the 11th Airborne Division. Uh, us that uh, was not able to rotate back because our time was not up, you know, we uh, they sent out to the 187th, and that was a Gatlingen's concern uh, right outside of Wolfsburg, Germany. and. Uh, so we come back from a field operation about uh, July and hell, we went on alert and that was uh, uh, 11 ideal. Uh, first time anybody had been in 11. We flew out of 1st and Pembroke, loaded to the gill already, you know, into, uh, well, we ended up in Adana, Turkey, and then the next day we flew into Lebanon and we spent three months over there. How would you like Lebanon? Um, uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I was a BAR man, and uh, uh, we would take patrols all the time, you know, all the way around, and and the people were just fantastic, actually, you know, they, they liked Americans back then. They were still using the V for Victory from World War II, okay. and we received that quite often. I'll never forget that we was on a patrol and we was uh, coming up to this old fella, you know, on a trail and he was out bird hunting and they, he had an old shotgun, you know, they he'd pour powder in, put a little bit of cigarette paper mm -hmm. down, pour a little shot in, you know, and chew birds, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to eat, actually. And uh, so he liked, we had the M1s back there still, and he liked that gun. He says, oh, we could. So the guy's asking me if we want to shoot it, and he says, oh, you know, and so he wanted to squat and to shoot it, you know, he said, no, no, you got to lay down, you will shoot down the valley there, you know, it went nothing around, actually it was going into the desert, you know, and uh, <laughs> he said, no, no, so finally he insisted on firing it in a squat. <laughs> 
he just went <laughs> And man, he loved that guy. And I never will forget that. He loved the God and Bruce. He wanted a badge, you know. But uh, we were still in the old uh, green uniform, or the uh, OGs uh, uniforms, you know. And, and in fact, you know, back then, a company commander always had to carry a small safe, you know. And um, so we had to put money in that safe to buy the, the new uniforms was coming out and we would have to buy a, our new uh, green uniform, you know, taking in place of the OGs. And we really lucked out there because uh, when we got back we was in what they considered uh, a combat zone in a way. It wasn't combat but it was uh, expeditionary uh, metal type of operations, you know. It could be turning into that, but we was in that area for over 90 days, and if you are, you got a complete new issue. <laughs> so, so, so the old man gave us our money back, and then we had the biggest drunk he'd ever been. <laughs> but them days, uh, also, Bruce, it was uh, uh, quite interesting because I tell you what, when we come back, we was in isolation, uh, going through. Uh, medical station for shots and everything else you know and check them for worms and stuff you know and so how'd you get the special forces um i come went to uh, of course back to the states i was in the 101st and uh, we uh, got assigned to go to well we didn't really know at the time that we was going to vietnam and uh, we did go by boat and i told you going over and I wasn't real happy with uh, the conventional units. I couldn't really tell you why, Bruce. Uh, uh, just too much stuff going on, I reckon. But uh, whenever I got back to the States, I said, I'm going to go to Spatial Forces. I heard about the Spatial Forces, and that would have been, I think, around 1966. That's when I went through that training group. So, so in '65, you were in Vietnam with the 101. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's we went over. Uh, General Leroy Altenge was the name of the uh, ship. We had attachments of, and everything with the uh, First Brigade, uh, and I think that were around 3,600 people, including every, all the attachments and everything. And that place is that. Boat was so damn packed, you know. Oh, you couldn't yeah. move. It was terrible, you know. So we was all ready to go once we got over there. It took a long time. I think 21 days to get there after we had drifted back across the, when the boat broke down, you know. Midway over is when they did let us know where we was headed. We knew already, you know, through rumors that we was heading to Vietnam. Uh, but when I come back, I just decided I. I did not like conventional units, and uh, and I, I I think too I'd heard about the spatial forces, and and I liked the challenge that it, it produced, uh, you know, back then, and uh, so I chose to do that. What was your MOS, special forces? Uh, that one Bravo, four SG, for German. I went through that German course and uh, language, so. Uh, Forest uh, G as a weapons man at that time. So, going through Forest G, were you slave to go to Germany? Or maybe. Were you slave to go back to Germany for uh, with 10th Group? No. No? Okay. I never was in a 10th. Uh, I tried to join the 10th from Germany. They wouldn't let none of us left the 10th. Group. No, okay. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. I don't know, but we was all denied, you know, going. And that was also part of, I think, I, I started hearing more and more about the uh, 10th group, you know, about Spatial Forces and stuff, and I really felt that that was a... So what group were you in when you first got into Spatial Forces? Uh, when I first uh, first got in Space Forces was 5th group. Okay, it was 5th group. Yeah. Okay, at Fort Bragg? At Fort Bragg. Well, uh, yeah, right after I got out of uh, training group is when I got assignment to go to 5th group at, uh, in Vietnam. Um, and then when I come back, I, I was assigned to 5th group, you know, when I got back from Vietnam. And then I think 
I went back to Vietnam again, but I was not in Sog then. I, I was down at Dong Baten training the Cambodians. And then I was in 10th group up at Devons for just a while, you know. How'd you hear about Sog the first time? Uh, when I went to Vietnam, right after being out of get, getting out of training group, uh, when I went, got there, they was we went out and did that training on that little island right down by the train and come back and people started talking about uh, SOG and uh, I'd never heard about it until then. It, it was kept pretty quiet, you know. And whenever I would get assignments, you know, uh, out of the personnel section of where we would be assigned there in the train, um, they assigned me to A Company. And I was walking away, and, and I said, I was saying, oh, crap, A Company, I want to get in that SOG. The guy overheard me, <laughs> and uh, he turned turn around, he says, hey, come here. And he said, I heard you say you wished you had gotten SOG, and I says, yeah. And I'm, I'm saying, I'm trying, I don't know how I said all of this stuff, uh, Bruce, but that, what I feel that I, I said, I said, I wanted, yeah, I'd like to get in the SOG. Do you know anything about it? And I says, I, just what I've heard here, you know, since I got back. He says, I'll fix you up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how I got in the SOG. So what did you hear about it? Uh, most all of it was uh, that it was a classified unit. Uh, you would be assigned to uh, different teams, just bits and pieces, you know, and and to me that, that to me, was a challenge, kind of a challenge in life, I think I really wanted. Uh, <clears throat> Where were you briefed at about Sog? The train or Da Nang? From, uh, like a lot of people say, they go into uh, <clears throat> a building and uh, like Warren would come in, Colonel Warren would say, give a spiel about Sog, if you want to stay, you can stay in, or if you, you know, but you know, you have to sign these classified documents. Uh, they flew the ones that uh, was uh, signed us off. We, we hopped on an aircraft and flew into Da Nang. And then they divided us up there, and uh, some of the guys went on over to CCC, and uh, some of us stayed there at, uh, at CCN. Um, we went up to talk. First, we went in to talk. Or first, excuse me, we went into the headquarters and talked to, I don't know who was the command sergeant major then, but talked to him, you know. And uh, he was kind of assigning some of us, you know, that you'll be going to uh, one of the spike teams or you'll be going to the hatchet force or stuff like this. And of course, we really didn't know that much about it, so we just took it for granted. Then they took us over to talk and set us down and explained everything. And I have heard that later times uh, uh, they did not uh, have code names and stuff, you know, but. At that time, uh, they did have code names, and what they did, they took a list of names, code names, out of a safe in talk, and told us that there was three of us, I believe, three or four of us that was going to be assigned, and he said, you can pick any code name on this paper if you'd like to have. Well, I seen Gambler, and I thought that was cool as hell, you know. <laughs> I so I says, I'll take this one right here. So actually, we got to pick our own code names. Um, and of course, uh, I, I guess why they probably quit that later. I heard they had quit giving code names, but we never used them. Uh, of course, when I, everybody started saying, calling me that, and even back in the States today, a lot of people still, you know, call me Gambler, you know. And, uh, so it was just Gambler, not The Gambler? Just gambler, gambler but I, yeah. well, gambler. Yeah, okay. Well, but I, I know uh, Gene. Some of the guys say the gambler. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like when they talk at me about me, you know, they say the gambler, you know, or something. But so, what team were you assigned to? I was assigned to uh, Team Rattler, uh, and of course that was uh, well. The uh, I can't think of the one zero. He had just got hit in the shoulder. He was a, a Indian, uh, American Indian, uh, and I can't remember his name. But he got hit in the shoulder, so they were short uh, man, you know. And uh, we was kind of asked uh, what teams was available you could go to. 
and just about all of them was available because there wasn't many guys running SOG, mm -hmm. running the operations in. And I kind of liked Rattler. I, I thought Rattler was a pretty cool name also. And uh, so I started training with them. Were you the one two? I was the one one. A one one, okay. Yeah, there was just actually two, two okay. of us on there. A, a fellow by the name of Ames, Ed Ames, uh, took over as a one zero. Uh, but uh, there was just two of us Americans on the team. So he was a one zero, I was a one one. Uh, and then, of course, the team, uh, which you have a picture of now, is the Nungs. And, uh, How many total Nungs did you have? I think there was around six or seven. Okay. Um, and all of them, I think, is in one of them pictures I had given you. Mm -hmm. uh, there must have been six or seven is what we had on the uh, team. So when you ran missions, did you run with all of them or just four or five Nungs? Uh, we would run with, it, it depended on what the op, what it was called for. Uh, and then also at that time, the one zero would be just alerted uh, of where he was going in. And that was it. And then they put us in isolation. And in isolation, uh, actually was Bob Ward, you know, and, and we stayed in there for four to five days. Uh, when me and Ames would do an area study, the guard would take us over to talk to do the area study. Uh, we did not let any of the ditch nuns know where we was going uh, at that time. That was actually taboo, you know. All they knew was that we was going on a target. Uh, we just felt that we had heard bad stories about uh, uh, being compromised, you know, on the operations before he ever even got in on a target. So we did, we would study, you know, our immediate action drills and stuff like that, you know, and rest overnight on ours, you know, there in the Bob Ward fence. But uh, they brought us our food, chow. Uh, the building had the uh, showers right there. They had put, fixed it up where we could uh, shower. But then we did not want to shower because we wanted to be dirty and stink, you know, when we went in. And so we would not let none of our people even go near that shower, you know. Did uh, you did you eat the uh, Indian rations before going in? Uh, did we? Uh, well, I, keep, I can't remember yeah. whether, yeah, you're talking about the regular Indian rations. Yeah. Uh, we got regular rations from the mess hall, you know. Uh, we didn't start that. Uh, I, I I can't remember. I think the Indians got their type of uh, mess hall. They had their own mess hall and they fed them their type of food. But we had a, a policy when we went in, in, we took uh, no crap pills. And uh, that was just our policy, which I thought was a good policy. And then, of course, when you come back out off of targets, you know, whether you shot out or got x out, you know, uh, you'd take crack pills where you could go to the bathroom, you know. So most of the guys' system today, I think, is goofed up from that type of operations, you know. But uh, So that's, were you guys uh, at that time a spike team or R team? We were spike teams, okay. yeah. We changed from spike teams after the Marble Mountain incident. Uh, um, So that must have been October, August, September. Probably in the mid October is when they changed to RT teams. Uh, and the reason I say that is because after I come down, that's when I went to, uh, you know, the old Thundercloud team. And uh, actually, me and Westerfeld got to pick out a name for the team. Okay because of it being a uh, thunder cloud, excuse me. Um, of course, that was kind of a different story, you know, of why, how I ended up there. I had mentioned to you about, he had asked if I'd like to run with him, and uh, of course I jumped on it, but I had a lot of reasons why after Marble Mountain, uh, 
the nuns run out on me. Yeah. You know, so. So how many times did you go across the fence with uh, our, team, our spike team rattler? I think we had maybe two, and then one in country operation. So you were at FOB four later designated CCN at Denang, August twenty third, sixty eight. FOB-4 was attacked by a large uh, sapper element. Can you tell the viewers a little bit about that attack? Uh, yeah, it was uh, two or three days before the attack was uh, August the 23rd. Uh, two or three days, we had been alerted, uh, Team Rattler, uh, that um, we would be moving up as a listening post on Marble Mountain. and. Uh, the pictures uh, there is, shows the team as we was actually preparing ourselves to go up there. Uh, me and Ames went up and, had, you know, did some research and stuff, you know, of, of uh, uh, Marble Mountain, and you couldn't tell much, you know, actually. Uh, so all we did was really in preparations, what we thought we might need and stuff like that. And uh, that afternoon is when we traveled up uh, to the... Uh, top of Marble Mountain. Uh, we was very, pretty lucky. We had uh, uh, five gallon can water cans. Uh, so we had a, an old three quarter ton truck there in the compound. And of course we walked, but uh, they carried most of our gear that we was taking, you know. the uh, We had an M6 machine gun, a couple of M79 stuff, and we just put them in the back of that three quarter ton mm -hmm. truck, you know. And, and carried just our ham weapons, you know, up to the base of the uh, Marble Mountain. Um, and then, of course, uh, we had uh, heard stories about being booby-trapped on the, the steps and stuff, so it was very cautious going up, and it, it did take us a long time to get to the point of where we was heading. As we went up, uh, as I kind of mentioned uh, earlier, there was a uh, a Buddha temple off to the left side if you was climbing the um, off of the highway, I think one, uh, climbing the stairs and off to the left was where the Buddha temple was. It was a cave like back in. Um, then as we caught, got at the top of the, the stairs and it turned into just kind of a, a walk then of uh, whatever it curved to start curving around a little bit and off to the left was an open area. Uh, there had been somebody at the, then we went off to that left area and we was looking for the highest peak that we could get on. And there was actually a rope down, you know, that you could climb up. Not very, maybe it's 15, 20 feet to get to the very top of the peak. So what we did actually, uh, Bruce, was we cached our, our water can down there because of getting that stuff on up, you know, we'd had to pull rope, but we figured it was close enough that we just feel like canteens, not knowing that anything was going to happen, you know. And so we got uh, the perimeter all set up there. Uh, actually, that was the most vulnerable stops, place, the only really place that you could climb up. Uh, you could probably climb up, you know, the rest of the areas, but there was a the side uh, going down to our compound, you could not have climbed up on that. And also the uh, the side to where the uh, path come across, that was just sheer rock, I remember. You could not there. Uh, we got up top and there's a lot of large boulders, a lot of rocky area and stuff. We had set up our perimeter and everything. And uh, then we just took uh, turns at night. Me and Ames uh, took turns, you know, setting up a lake, uh, you know. Uh, the next day, Ames uh, had uh, asked me to take a couple guys and do a reconnaissance, you know, of the whole mountain. Bruce, we walked that mountain, we crawled through tunnels, you know. I was little enough that we could, we would crawl through where we'd crawl through and there you couldn't hardly get to, to the top. And we looked all over that mountain and in fact went into the Buddha uh, caves. And it was an eerie feeling, I do remember that. Uh, and really quiet, and the monks uh, was very quiet. And of course, we figured after everything did happen that maybe the reason why it was like that, you it's know. Give her a point. Uh, so, Larry, where would the outpost be on Marble Mountain? Uh, 
right in this area right here there's a small area going down we would set up there our compound was down in this area and we would set up here route one was over in this area where we come up and there was a little saddle and we went up into that point right there on the top it was probably about an 18 meters diameter you know up there I know that uh, when they bring in that spooky you know it, that rounds hit pretty close you know well, so like I say my name was stayed up and uh, stayed awake kind of as a listing post more than anything you know and hell Bruce uh, you could look out across the area and see d and all the lights and everything it's just real quiet you know and actually it was peaceful up there you know all the full stars and stars and it just it just was peaceful you could look out into the uh ocean uh, there you know and and uh, actually see little boats i guess fishermen and stuff i i just remember it was just a real quiet nice time uh, the next day it was just getting hot we went down and got water you know and and uh or just uh, be me and a couple of people would go down and just type canteens to us and throw some magazines in our pockets, you know, and climb down and, and uh, get the water and then back up, you know, and, and we just kind of camouflaged our cans stuff there, you know, down there with that uh, five gallon water. Uh, it was hotter than hell the next day, you know. In fact, I'd, I don't, I think we had one small lean to, and that was right by the radio, you know, we had communications. We had communications, there was a marine outfit set up on another peak. Uh, and I know if I had a compound was here, Marble Mountain was here, there was a peak off to that direction if we was on top and that. The Marines had a 106 recorders rifle set up up there. We had their uh, call sign and uh, frequency uh, on the radio there. Um, we would make contact, you know, just a lot of times during the day we would call up talk on there, not talk, but the communication center we had and talk to the guys on down there and just keep calm up and stuff and, and every once in a while we would talk to the Marines over there just as a calm check more than anything, you know. And so it was the next morning uh, and, I, uh, and I did a in my mind a lot of research because Tilt was wanting information from me and and some of the people you know and and I I recollect that it was around two somewhere around two whenever they hit our compound well they actually did not hit our compound first they hit that 106 over there at the marine outpost and I had found out later that they had because it was a big explosion well, the first thing I, I did was I tried to get communications with them and I could not uh, get anybody on it, you know. So I called uh, Talk and I was uh, uh, changing frequency and, and started trying to call uh, Talk when all hell broke loose down in our compound. And it was just absolutely unbelievable to see, I guess is the word. Uh, I, I do know that it was about that time we got hit like hell. And at first we didn't realize we were being hit, you know, there's so damn much noise and everything until all of a sudden, like I said, a lot of rocks and, and point up and rounds started hitting it. And, uh, Ooh, were they hitting with grenades, AKs, all of it? It, it was small arms. Small arms. Uh, I, and so we started observing about that time and one of the nuns hollered at me. I was still on the side with the compound and he hollered at me, don't see, don't see, uh, mortar, mortar, you know. And So I ran over there and, and we seen a flash a couple of times, a flash, two of them, you know, where they'd drop it and you'd see a flash. And so I, we had two M79s up there and uh, that was the best thing for the position to after doing kind of the area study we decided that would be a vulnerable machine gun you know would be a good uh, weapon but uh, we both I said start shooting so we started shooting M79 down there you know and then we stopped the flies and just like that and uh, so then we started putting in some M16 parts you know the others at the same time right 
down in that area there. And uh, then the next day, uh, uh, we got hit uh, one more time that morning still yet. From, it was real heavy and, and then it kind of let up after we started firing down there and, and, and shooting them 79s down there, 40 mics on the, uh, uh, the 80, they were 82 mortars that ended up being what they were shooting into our camp. They were far right over us. You could almost hear, hear it, almost see it, you know, going over and into the camp. Uh, the next morning, it was just dead quiet. And I, I was looking down the compound, and you could see people walking around. It was just disaster, still stuff burning. And uh, I do remember that one of the biggest fires was over at the uh, communications center. That whole thing had burned down to the ground, you know. And, after I, I got off the hill. Uh, but we didn't have, we were out of water. And uh, so I don't know who it was, either me or Ames. Uh, Ames might have uh, said, Larry, run down and get some water, or I might have just decided to. But I took the interpreter, Bing. Bing was the uh, zero one, which was actually the indigenous uh, team leader. And then your two, number two, was uh, interpreter. And uh, so we went down, uh, and I loaded up with just magazines, you know, in my pockets, just to be lighter than just my uh, uh, M16, car 15. And the, one of the indits went down, and then I, uh, I'm not sure who went down but the next but anyway I was going to be the last one down well sometime in between that I was starting down and I heard a bunch of hollering going on and I hollered down uh, what's going on and uh, the interpreter I can't I wish I could think of his name but anyway he hollered up and said uh, MVA or VC or something want us to give up you know and I hollered I thank God the wrong I did holler, why aren't you shooting? <laughs> and so when I hit the ground, and it was just a, a short paw, I just kind of tumbled down, you know. We got up and hell, they took off. It scared the hell out of my guess. <laughs> you know, the reaction real fast, you know. And so I just I said, get them. And, uh, and uh, so we was going around that path because they took off back towards, uh, well, the ocean or the marine where it goes on over and down. Uh, they held towards uh, that marine amphibious outfit, and uh, I hollered up at Ames to throw me my low battery equipment, and um, so he did throw it down, and I held it. when I grabbed it, I didn't find this out till later, but I have one of them uh, they, knives that they call Saga, uh, the train can give us, you know, and had, had broke that down. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I grabbed that up and we continued. I had hollered at Ames, I said, oh, watch out, you know, for us in front of us and use that machine gun. Anyway, uh, we kind of run on up there and run across that 82 mortar. One of them was still set with uh, just brush up against it. And I said, uh, I hollered, grab the two. And I do remember saying, not the base plate, we don't care, just get that two. We didn't have anything, you know, to destroy it with. So I decided we'd take it with us. And I seen a rucksack, I grabbed it. And uh, I said, so I, I do remember it saying, and I don't know how I said it, but let's get the hell out of here before they get to rack together. <laughs> Something in that words, you know. <laughs> so we took off running back down there, and I was hollering at Ames at the same time to throw some uh, ropes down. And uh, we had them Swiss seats in, and he threw uh, tied a couple together and threw them down, you know. And I, I don't know where it got all the rope. We had actually enough to get to the point where we was, you know. And then we, we tied them, that equipment, he pulled it up. And by that time, we was kind of in a, a small fire fight. It wasn't a heavy one, but we was trying to get back up to start up the rope. and. Anyway, I'd stayed the last, I was the last one down. It was kind of our policy on everything, you know, that America would be the first in and last out of no matter where we was. And um, 
uh, Ames had called down a talk and told talk that we had captured some equipment, and they sent a king bee up, you know, and it couldn't land. All it could do was hover, and uh, and I was climbing up, and and Ames would jumped on a damn chopper. I hollered and said, "Where the hell are you going?" He said, "They want me down in talk," and uh, so he took off with them. So, uh, and I I don't know, you know, it was. A hell of a lot that went on, and I guess I had to really sit down and think a lot about this, uh, Bruce, before whenever Tilt was asking me, you know, to give him some information on it. And, and uh, but I do know it was hectic then, and I do know we was hit a couple more times uh, uh, during that day, and had to get reset back up and everything. And uh, I talked to him down at uh, Talk, and uh, asked when Ames was going to come back up. And, and uh, there was so much turmoil at that time down there, you couldn't hardly talk to nobody, even, you know, on the radio. And uh, so anyway, we just sat back up, and and uh, I did, I do know, after everything kind of got settled down, it was later in the afternoon that Colonel Warren called up, you know, and asked what we needed up there. And I says, well, we need some rations, and one of the biggest things I remember wanting was was um, hand grenades, because that was our best defense right there you could ever have was a hand grenades, you know, because we could just throw them down on them and stop them like that. But we had about used up everything we had on hand grenades, you know, anyway. And and, uh, and he said anything else, and I do remember, I says, yeah, I, I says, we need cigarettes, and I says, we need Coca-Cola, I need beer, <laughs> and by God, he sent it up. And it wasn't them, but it was the next morning, and we had got hit that night some, but it was the next morning that uh, that they flew a king bee and just dropped it off because they could only do that hovering, you know, anyway. but And then it was uh, uh, pretty quiet, you know, it gotten quiet, but then did said, decided they were leaving. Even. You know, they was going to go back to camp. And I talked to the interpreter in the Zero One, you know, team leader, and, and said, I don't think you'll ever make it. You know, and they said, we're going. And so I actually, I talked to, got through the interpreter, I talked to each one of them, and they all decided they was going to leave. And so I called Talk up, and I asked them, I said, the indigenous people are leaving. They're coming back to the camp. And, uh, not knowing really what to do, you know, and and I do remember that the American, and I never found out who it was, Bruce, but he said, well, take their damn weapons and their equipment and let them go. <laughs> and I said, my ass, I mean to <laughs> So anyway, I talked to him, and they decided they was going to, and I says, well, I says, the only thing I asked is try to leave me as many as your hand grenades, you know, uh, to help me, and I and I says, I'll try to, where I can see you guys going down, I'll try to give you support. And uh, so they took off. Boy, I started resetting up Claymores and everything. Mm -hmm. I even set them on a freaking, just all the way around, you know, what we had. And so they got in a firefight. And all I could do was, I couldn't see them, but I, I fired into the area, you know, uh, where... I figured that part five was going on, and after a bit they come, they come by running back, and the interpreter, you know, says, "Tonk see, tonk see, we want to come back. We can't get down." And Bruce is scared the hell out of me, because I thought maybe they'd been captured, and uh, mm -hmm. so they're trying to trip me, and so I just hollered down, "No, <laughs> you <know, laughs> ain't coming back," and. Uh, and these are just things I recollect, you know, mm. and I don't know how long it went on, but I, I said, well, and I had the interpreter and at zero one, I said, you come on up and we'll talk. And, and the interpreter, uh, we talked for a while, and the zero one, I remember him saying that we will stay with you and fight till the end or something in that order, you know. Well, that, that was a relief to me. And of course, I did take that chance. That, and they had not been captured, but you know how your mind goes mm. 100 mile an hour. 
So they come up and we at that time resettled the claymores and stuff, you know, and and uh, then uh, I'm not sure if we got, uh, you know, uh, the chopper come in and drop the stuff before, but I, I kind of think it was after they had come back. Uh, and the reason I think that was because of the hand grenades, you know, they had given. Because when they did come up there, they, they dropped off, uh, they had a case of hand grenades and stuff, you know, and the other. He had the beer and the uh, Coke, because them, them guys like Coca-Cola, cut in ditch, you know. And uh, anyway, uh, it, it, we was up there a couple of days anyway, and I, I don't remember how, but I do know that the MBA um, had put down where the mortars was set up, they put an enormous MBA flag, you know, and uh, the interpreter, or the zero one, says, we'll go down and we capture the flag. And I said, no, you won't. I said, we'll take that M7 and we'll blow holes through that son of a bitch. <laughs> so, so we did. <clears throat> and it was probably laid up uh, because it got quiet after that. The flag stayed there. It just got quiet and it, it was over. I uh, didn't see any of them leaving, so who knows? Infiltrate out was through caves, maybe, or whatever, you know. But um, then they finally uh, got a king bee up there and picked us all up and took us off the hill. I think we stayed up there one more night. Did they, were you replaced by another group? Not at the time. Uh, I had neglected, in fact, forgot to tell you about they did try to send a hatchet force team up to relieve us. And that happened before the um, uh, before the indige took off, and uh, they could not get up the hill. Yes. They they could not get up the hill, and they had a couple wounded uh, down there at the uh, base where the steps was. And, there was that uh, many in the A there, or VC. They they got in a heavy bar fight. You oh. could hear the fight going on, and and uh, I thought I remembered who the American team leader was, but he said that was not him, <laughs> you know, when I got back in the camp. <laughs> Who knows, there was so much going on anyway, they couldn't get up the hill to relieve us, but, and that was before the team left me, left me by myself, and uh, of course, before they decided to leave, you know, with the leaving us. A, a token for us, that flag, you know. And uh, so anyway, they they uh, got us uh, down off the hill. I had stayed awake during the whole thing, and I had been uh, taking green hornets. How many days and nights were you awake? I stayed awake. I, ne I never did fall asleep. I was four, moving four, all the time, taking the three or four days. Oh. I was taking the green hornets, just <laughs> staying awake. The indigenous, we would not let them have them. We give them bennies, because uh, them green hornets was a little bit bad. <laughs> Whenever I did get back, uh, they sent an American out and had a couple guys hit, uh, you know, up was wounded, and, and they took them. They were walk, walk, and they uh, could walk. They took them to the dispensary. We had a, uh, a WP thrown on top of us up there. Um, and one of the guys got burnt in the arm real bad with that W. I don't know uh, what, whether it was uh, one of their uh, WP rounds or whether they had gotten a hold of an American uh, WP. I, we did get support up there by the Spooky. And I have, in fact, it wasn't that long ago, somebody called me and asked me if, if, uh, if I had called Spooky for support. <laughs> I said, no. I says, I called down to the uh, compound and told him we needed help up there and they had got a hold of Spooky and he come up and had our call sign. And he was talking to, I don't forget it, he was circling above us and, and uh, we made contact with each other, you know, and, and he said, well, put out some light so I can mark you. And so we had them strobe lights, you know, we used to carry them, we put out a strobe light he says, I can't mark you, there's too damn many other lights all over, you know. So I took a keg of C4 and broke it into him, put it on a rock like that. 
I says, I just let C4 can you see it or something. He says, I got you. He says, where do you want to fire? And I says, well, right around us. And he said, well, I advise you to hucker down because that shit's mm -hmm. bad. And all, so I called all the people, get in as close as we could together. And, and, uh, and all you who were like a burr, you know, and, and rocks didn't fly, but a lot of it went on that side because there wasn't that much room. Mm -hmm. But he did say that after I talked to the pilots later, you know what, through them, they said if they just did a little bit of turbulence, he says that gun goes crazy when it's firing, you know. So, but that, that helped us, uh, that kept them from, you know, hitting us. We, we got sporadic fire a lot, uh, but not no real hardcore hits, but a couple, you know. And, uh, so they, they never made a charge to overrun you? Huh? They never made a charge to try to overrun your position? I, uh, my thoughts on it was that they did want that position because how they could look right down into the compound and they could have set another mortar up there and, and with all the stuff going on and stuff, uh, who knows how long they would have had to punch a lot more damage down into the compound. You could see everything that was going on down there in the compound, Bruce. Uh, and from that point, you could have used small, small arms and just picked people off so damned easy, you know. Yeah. So there's two questions. Uh, I know uh, John Meyer Tilt did an interview, basically some of the same information, but there's one aspect that was kind of left out. What was in the, the backpack? Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, when we got down, I didn't know this till after we got down it. And they did, they, well, they, they took me to a hook. Mine had been blown up. I had a dog, Lily. Her name was Lily. She got killed. She was in a hooch. And uh, they had to her. So they put me in another hooch. And hell, one well, of the medics gave me some medicine just to make me sleep. My damned eyes wouldn't close. And uh, after all that, well, they took me up for debriefing. And they had, uh, in that rucksack, they had found information that they were going to hit the marine amphibious outfit the very next night and that did not happen you know and the marines this was a shock and Ames I don't know what ever happened to him I didn't ever see him again until at Fort Bragg um, anyway uh, the marines sent a three-quarter ton truck over and uh, picked me and the team up and we have they told us that the Marines was coming over to get us. And uh, they had they had a picnic for us or something. I forget what it was. So me and the team got on. They took us over to, drove us over to the uh, uh, Marine Amphibious Outfit. And they had an officer's club over there uh, building. And they took us in there and they had a barbecue for us. All the drinks we could drink. And of course the Indians, all they drink is Coca-Cola anyway. All they could drink Coca-Cola. But the Indians, their biggest thing was right inside they had like a guest board to sign. And hell, they all, <laughs> they loved that. They thought they were celebrities, you know, getting a sign. And uh, they took us back, you know, after kind of straightness and thanked us a million times because they thought that that's what flowed that uh, damn attack on oh, him. Yeah. It would have been a perfect attack because nobody would have dreamed that they'd have been hit. They might have been alert but not dream of being you know, so the other question is, did it cross your mind to fire all your nuns for deserting you at the time? To fire on them? To fire, fire all of them. To get, to get rid of all your nuns that deserted you on the, the mountain. That's kind of why I left the team Okay. Uh, at the bottom and jumped on top of that uh, when the uh, mountain, you know, Asked me if I'd like to go on the team, mm. on that the old Thundertop team. Okay, so after, <clears throat> after it was all said and done, um, what medals or citations did you get for your actions? In okay, I got the Arm Arcom with me, and also I got a um, the uh, Vietnamese Cross Gallantry from the with the Bronze Star on it from the Vietnamese. For that night? For, that or night. Four, four for nights? the operation. For the operation. Okay. Some believe you should have got 
much higher. Yeah. Some of your friends. That was that was okay with me. Okay. We got off of that mountain, uh, I think, and I I pray to God that we saved a lot of lives. You did. Yes. The incident happened on the twenty third. When did you get to RT asked? Uh, it was it was very shortly after it. Everything had kind of cooled down, uh, you know, from uh, the attack on the compound, and that's when um, uh, I always called him out. We run one operation. It was one more had a special operation. We were trying to capture some uh, guy. It wasn't successful, and he was at the time as I mentioned that he come out of Korea. Uh, and got, had uh, been, uh, what they call it? Anyway, he was an uh, officer, and because of, uh, after Korea, they didn't need that many officers, so they ripped him down to uh, uh, enlisted. And uh, he was, I think, in his 30s, you know, at the time, and he said, I'm done running. And nobody regretted anybody if they run targets. Nobody regret you had an open door whenever you wanted it, you know. And nobody was against that, you know. Or figured it, it was time to stop. And uh, he could when they when we got in trouble over there, uh, they started chases and he couldn't keep up. And so I, I just told him. Drop your rucksacks. I want you to grab him, drag him if you want to, because he has to stay. He says, I'll stay here and I'll hold him off while you guys get away. Oh. And, uh, and I'll never forget that. But when I come back uh, to the States, uh, you know, in between that time is when uh, they were changing Owen High School from uh, down to Fort Huachuca. Uh, and they had not got moved, so they had a course, O and I course there in at, uh, at Fort Bragg, and I went through that uh, course. And he had uh, he was married to a um, the girl that owned the uh, Flaming Torch restaurant down there, and she was a German girl, and. They had got in contact with me and invited me up to the NCL club for uh, uh, dinner, you know. And when uh, Mount had went to the restroom, his wife real fast says, I want to thank you for what happened. Something in them words said he has explained everything to me. And I just want to thank you uh, for that. And she had that flaming torch. They, <laughs> they had a couple of nice Cadillac cars and stuff. Mm -hmm. said, Whatever you want, hey, we got an extra car if you'd want to use it, you know. And I said, no, thank you. I'm going to school, so it really, I don't need it, you know. So were you, when you went to, he was the one zero, you're the one one? Yes. And you became the one one? Or, I become. Oh, the one zero, I mean? Yeah, I become the one zero after, after okay. that. And uh, he come back to the States, and he had, I, and I, we didn't keep up with each other. I know me and him had sat on the beach a lot and just talked, you know, and, but I did that with all of that, and our ditch too. We used to go down to the beach, and you don't know the language, but you can communicate. And uh, and got pretty tight with with everybody on the team and everything. And uh, he would learn to love each other whenever you're in combat, you know. So, so your team was made up of North Vietnamese. They were captured, put in the POW camp, and then they were interviewed. Is that kind of work? Uh, yeah. Uh, they had either give themselves up, Choi Hoi, or had been captured. And they did. They put them in a camp, rehabilitated them, and I guess asked them if, after these guys, asked them if they wanted to work for Americans or something in that order. But anyway, that's, that's how that originated, how Thundercloud originated. And I believe that the, I never met the guy, the Screamwood. But I think it was English, and some people have told me he was, and he was from England. But but uh, he didn't go with him on operations, you know. Just they went in with MDA uniforms and and uh, did the assignment and, and come out. But uh, it it wasn't successful like that. And that's when uh, Colonel Warren decided to make him into a spike team. So so um, I don't know if you ever heard the story about 
Lynn Black. He yeah, had, he had a team, yeah, no, yeah. and so he had his his North Vietnamese at the range, and they all turned their guns on him. And uh, did you ever hear that story? <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me. Oh, is that right? Can you tell us about that? Uh, yes, I can. You know, we were really had set up after all this here had happened. Uh, the compound really did a lot of reinventing protection. And, uh, and a lot of people on the line, well, uh, I was on a spike team then, and they put us on the line down there. You know, well, there was a Vietnamese, uh, like a platoon or a squad or whatever they have, was on the a compound. And I forget what their mission was there anyway, but they was there. and. They had sent down, there, the NCOIC of them come down there and was drunk. And I run his ass off the line. I said, she ain't come down there with this goddamn line drunk. Whatever words I used, I don't remember, but I told him was. Well, apparently, he went back and told his Daiwi that, uh, that the spatial team, the MVA team, was trying to kill him. And so the Daiwi come down there and when we had a confrontation, me and him, as far as we are from each other, as far as I <laughs> took my safety off, it was that bad. Oh, okay. He did speak English he, that, that we. And I don't know, somehow it finally ended and they left the compound. Now the next day I was supposed to make up a uh, a letter, you know, or, or a little description of what took place. And I could pretty well gotten some trouble with that. <laughs> I made a statement. I said, I'm a fighter, not a freaking writer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took almost the exact words I told him. <laughs> kind of was hiding, biting a bullet for a little while, you know, keeping a low profile. <laughs> but, uh, but that, I, yes. That act in the incident even happened to us. I, I did not hear that happen in the land. Yes, yeah, so apparently they turned his gun, their guns on him. He uh -huh. put his gun down and they all just took off running. So we called the talk and they sent him some helicopters and found the guys. Yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, uh, no, I had heard that with them, but. A lot of things happen over there, you know. Mm -hmm. and, so, so what is your funniest story that happened while you were in SOG? Pardon me? Your funniest story that happened <laughs> while you were in SOG. Uh, the funniest is something I probably hadn't already discussed. <laughs> I'll, te I'll tell you about it okay, later, fair, okay? Sure. Uh, other funny things, um, I remember they used to have uh, uh, movies for us, you know, outside every night. And uh, I had a freaking ingrown board on the bottom of my foot, so I was running around with flip flops on, you know. And I don't know what happened. Anyway, somebody on the line fired or something, and everybody just took off running, you know, for the hooches to grab up their freaking low bearing equipment and stuff. And I couldn't even walk on that foot, so I don't know how foul I got to. <laughs> But that was probably the funniest, but I'll explain the other one okay. uh, to you at another time. So there's a picture of you with Martha Ray. So Mar oh. Martha would visit the SF camps, including the SOG camps. I even heard she went up on um, the relay systems you guys had, um, Hickory and uh, the other one. Anyways. Um, yeah, and I don't doubt it. Martha yeah. Ray was quite the lady. So, yeah, she was very courageous, courageous in uh, the life of a woman, according to the SOG guys. Okay, so she would drink with you guys. So you drank with, with her that night. Who who drank more? <laughs> <laughs> I've drank with that lady a few times. Okay. <laughs> and even my wife got the... the could, could she keep up with you? Oh, hell yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> she drank vodka and water. Okay. Vodka and water, if I recall. And... Uh, but yeah, she was quite the lady. I had given the picture, you said there's a picture. Um, I didn't know that existed. And the way that picture was found was uh, my uh, 
youngest boy, he worked out here with a halfway uh, house, or it's, I guess it's a halfway where kids that's in trouble, but they're trying to recoup them and make something out of them, you know. Uh, anyway, he worked at that school, and he had went to work one morning, and he was wearing one of the sob shirts, rider shirts, and they said, oh, you was in a war or something. He said, well, no, no, my dad was in that war, you know, Vietnam. And uh, uh, they said, oh. So they looked it up on the internet and brought a picture in to Brad the next day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Brad brought the picture home and showed me. He said, Dad, you remember? And I said, no, hell no, I don't. How they get that? I don't know who turned that in, but it was on the internet uh, some way. But uh, I had given uh, Martha Ray, oh, I had given her a K bar and a rain jacket, you know, that night in, in the club. And uh, on the picture uh, that, uh, that oh, exists yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in fact, I went down to her house when I come back down to Bear Lair, when she's down there. But. Uh, she always, uh, you know, uh, come in, we'd all say, where's Maggie's drawers at, you know? <laughs> well, she'd always bring a little bikini, you know, and, and uh, to all the bars that she'd go to, that guy right there is in trouble, it's a squirrel. <laughs> he come around here and, and screwed up and got in all my pants here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, what what year was your first year at the uh, SOAR? Yeah. What was your first year going to SOAR? Um, um, I want to say, would 81 sound about right? Who was, there was a couple before, my numbers, I think uh, 169 or something like that. Yeah, so it started, I think, 77. Okay, so it would have, if it started 77, then it was 81, not 7. So then, um, well, yeah, I hadn't even retired yet. Yeah, yeah they went. They went to Thailand one year, right? Yes, they one, did. One of the early years. Make it. Yeah, uh, I didn't go on that, but I do yeah. remember yeah. doing that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say about eighty-one then when I joined them. So, was it therapeutic for you joining SOAR, going to SOAR, seeing your old friends, and talking about memories and? Yeah. You know, the, the first one I went to was at the landmark, where they had the big uh, tower. And all we didn't have, they didn't have the rooms in. We had little cabins out, outside there in Las mm -hmm. Vegas. And uh, they put one of the guys' room, and they put all the beer in a in a bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. So your first one, how many how many guys were there? Oh God, I don't know. <laughs> there was a. Uh, Seemed like it was a lot there, okay. but you know, of course, we was elbow to elbow in them little rooms, you know, yeah. and then go outside, you know, to have a beer yeah. out there at the landmark. So they say the early ones that there was, um, you guys were pretty wild. Um, <laughs> uh, some fist fights, and someone says at one of the hotels they were peeling off the roof, and they kicked them out of the hotel. Was it, was it like that back then? I would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good times, right? About repelling off the roofs, I'm not sure, but I know it got pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> so, saw guys are known for doing practical jokes. Did you ever do one or have one put on you? Um, I don't remember ever having one put on me, but I know I've been involved in a few put on me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I probably did have them, yeah. <laughs> me, but probably wouldn't admit to it, right? <laughs> so you remained in the Army um, after your time with SOG. Um, you know, SOG was classified for what, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So could you talk to fellow um, soldiers or family, friends? Did they understand? I mean, or did you keep it inside? I have Actually, I had honestly kind of forgot about it. You know, when we did leave uh, South, we had to sign a statement. Right. I don't know if you knew that, but we mm -hmm. signed a statement. We'd never fail what we'd done. And I don't know if that was just kept at SOG headquarters, which I guess it was, but uh, I honored that. You know, Susan never knew what I did for years. And it just wasn't discussed. And I, and I just 
actually kind of forgot about it, Bruce. You know, I, I, I did have memories of different ones, you know, but I uh, had good, bad memories. Not nightmares, movie, or memories, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess I didn't pay much attention. I heard, and I still guess it might be, I think Tilt told me it was declassified about 1993. Would that sound right? It sounds about right. I, I, I think Tilt told me that. It's just but, when John's Placer book came out, right about then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I kind of like John's, uh, uh, I got his book. I, I never have read nobody, all the no. <laughs> the whole book. When Sue would get her hair done, Bruce, I would take one of the books, you know, and <laughs> read a little bit, you know. But uh, John Plaster, when he signed my book, he says, Larry, your name is the first name in my book. And that was what the Vietnam Commandos, I think he had one of his first books. And that's when we was working on that. You haven't never lived until you've almost died for life as a paper. When you read, come in, we'll never know. So, is there anything else you would like to talk about? No, sir. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for, uh, for the interview. Thank you much for your service. So this concludes the interview with Gambler. Not the Gambler, Gambler. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Larry Trimble, the true American hero. If you enjoyed this interview, please subscribe and give us a like. We are conducting more interviews with the assistance of viewers like you. Your donations will assist us in recording the history of American heroes. You can donate on the history of Mac v. SOG www.sogsite.com. There is a donation page. Or on PayPal. Donate to Special Operations Group at Comcast.net. Please visit the history of Mac v. SOG www.sogsite.com. Become a paid sponsor for this project. Contact us at Special Operations Group at Comcast.net. Paid sponsor. Everything Special Operations. www.everythingspecialoperations.com. Leading source of Special Operations products. For all other Special Operations products, visit Special Operations Group at www.norbay.com.